Welcome to Past Forward, International Conversations in History Education. I am Hasin Haputandri, joining you from Colombo, Sri Lanka. As a history buff and an art lover, I would like to start with a provocation. Is art history? As in, can art be considered history? The very fact that this question is a provocation means that it is not. We all love art, but the moment we connect it to history, we feel that it is a less factual and less objective form of documentation. In fact, I found similar sentiments expressed towards literature when historian W. M. Meister observes in a moving reflection of his own experience of being a student of history at Harvard that the common cliché of the time as being the better the literature, the less it might offer as historical substance. Any attempt in answering this seriously makes us question, what is history really? And can we be objective? What better place to start than with Julius Caesar? There are facts and there are historical facts, historian E.H. Carr reminded us years ago. Fact, lots of people crossed the Rubicon. Historical fact, Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BCE. When does a plain old fact rise to the level of a historical fact? The short answer, when a historian decides it does. This alone should give serious pause when someone prattles on about historians needing to be objective. Furthermore, when we look at how history is taught in schools, expounded in museums, or dramatized in television and films we consume daily, we can easily recognize the weakness of this argument. History, too, is a story. A story is subjective. In fact, the history we include or exclude from our textbooks, museums and TV shows depend not so much on history or our past itself, but overridingly on our present circumstances and needs. Teaching of national histories in post-colonial world is a great example of this. Another challenge that strikes me most is the compartmentalization of academic disciplines related to the study of the past. Again, historian W. M. Meister claims that at the time when he was a student at Harvard, history was a discipline depending on written sources. Then common categorizations of prehistory, which is before written sources, and protohistory with undecipherable sources were left to the discipline of archaeology. So then there is history, there is art history and archaeology which all deal with the past, although we choose to study these separately. We could and should broaden this list of subjects to other disciplines such as anthropology, literature and classics as well. So, one of the key points I wish to make is that the academic discipline of history is but a small piece of the puzzle called the past. There are other social processes that influence our perception of the past. Media, ideologically or politically driven groups and power structures all produce competing narratives about the past. This public arena is where things get very messy and often very emotional. Parallel to all these different interpretations, the common person also has his or her own understanding of the past. Michael Oakeshott's idea of the practical past is a useful concept in understanding the role the past plays in an individual's day-to-day -day life. Practical past is the version of the past that most of us carry around with us in our minds and draw on in the performing of our daily tasks where we are compelled to judge situations, solve problems, make decisions. It is made up of all those memories and illusions, bits of vagrant information, attitudes and values. Above all, the practical past is a functional past. All of these propositions suggest that history or more broadly, the past is a representation or an interpretation of things that happened. 
this interpretation is mediated by evidence, methodology, ideology and subjectivity. Who we are and how we work and what we believe filters the interpretation of the past we claim. Interestingly, art is also a representation. It is not exactly reality. It is a subjective interpretation of something by someone. This is why when we choose art as a method to study history or record history, it becomes extremely exciting. Unlike theoreticians, artists are unbridled by objectivity and disciplinary boundaries. For example, contemporary Lebanese artist Nada Sahmi makes a series of paintings on the Lebanese war that shows how the statistics that are thrown around, which, by the way, are facts, reduce the human tragedy of war and its lasting repercussions. So artists often capture nuances that fact-recording historians miss. Another fascinating aspect is that art is actually a product of historical discourses. We have seen this in many great paintings of the world. On the other hand, it also produces or contributes to historical discourses. For instance, this contemporary painting from Sri Lankan artist Jagat Veera Singha touches upon socio-political aspects of the island's most recent history. During its three decades of civil war, many rural youth joined the Sri Lankan army, which gave them a new common identity while somewhat erasing their individuality. Hence the question, who are you, soldier? Both these contemporary pieces indicate a poignant engagement with modern history, which is different to what we are used to. Let's take a mainstream example of how this change of narrative or perspective can be traced in the history of art. This painting by François Girard will remind you of thousands of such paintings depicting the heroes all the way up to the 19th century. This painting represents the legendary battle of Austerlitz, which, by the way, is one of the key events also represented in Leo Tolstoy's great novel, War and Peace. Gerard's historical painting is typical of the manner in which one looks back at history. It is usually grand, with heroes on horseback who are the victors shining in the limelight. Increasingly, this view of the past is contested all around the world. What about those who do not make it into history books or remembered in historical paintings in museums like Napoleon in the above painting? What about those who lose, those who are repressed, erased or forgotten? What about women and children? Besides, should reflecting on the past be a mere act of nostalgia, national pride or an ego boost? Around the same time, an alternative perspective emerges. Another artist, Francisco de Goya, painted his now celebrated painting, 3rd of May, 1808, in the early 19th century, when the world was still steeped in the traditions of courtly and religious paintings. 3rd of May commemorates the events surrounding the Madrid uprising against the occupying French from a totally different, or more accurately, modern perspective. The painting has no celebrated heroes, only nameless victims. It records no brave deeds, only a gruesome act. It is not a painting of valour. Merely what Goya actually saw, blood, fear, suppression and darkness. We do not know how the painting was received at the time or if it was ever displayed in public at all. But hundred years later, the painting went on to influence great artists such as Pablo Picasso. The influence is very clear in Massacre in Korea in 1951 and even the famous painting Guernica. This brings me to the final observation on art and history, that is, the narrative and representation are interconnected. When you change the narrative, you change the representation, but most importantly, when you change the representation, you change the narrative. 
Now, let us look at some examples on how contemporary artists are challenging and changing the narrative. The first in the series is Egyptian artist Hossam Dirar, who is using his medium very much to document a historical event, the Egyptian Revolution of 2011. This is artists playing the role of the documenter, archivist and historian. Dirar is bearing direct witness to history and recording it in his canvas, which will be a window into the past for future generations. Sri Lankan artist T. Sanathanan records the traumatic memories of his community experiencing war and displacement. His installation, Cabinet of Resistance, is an archive of collective memory. Sanathanan is also committing this to history by bringing together his art practice with that of archiving and documentation. In his work Sugar on the Chapel, Brazilian artist Thiago Santana covers a chapel in sugar. Having grown up, in the sugarcane plantations, he is trying to respond to the bitter history of colonialism. By covering history books and illustrations in sugar, he is trying to highlight the ongoing whitewashing of historical events. These three artists are examples from a collaborative initiative, World Art and Memory Museum, which features artists from seven different countries exploring their pasts through their art, challenging dominant narratives and recording events that might get left out of history books for future generations. In conclusion, let's revisit our original provocation. Is art history? Clearly, art is already a part of history making. It records not just fact, but also emotion, thereby foregrounding empathy and critical attention. If we are advocating for a change in history education, then we should advocate for the way in which we approach history as well. And we must integrate interdisciplinary, subjective approaches provided by art in studying history and moving away from a limited academic understanding of our circumstances. Modern art, literature, film, photography are today integral part of history writing and history making, interpreting and teaching. Now, which work of art will you bring into your next history class? Thank you for joining Past Forward International Conversations in History Education.